Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for thank you. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. My name is Julia Dolan. I am the Minor White Curator of Photography, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the Portland Art Museum for this celebration of Minor White and his early career, and the photographs that form the foundation of this museum's photography collection. I am grateful to our distinguished speakers who have come from all over the country, as well as from around the corner, to share their ideas about White's beginnings with us today. And I am particularly thankful to Kate Boussard, the Peter C. Bunnell Curator of Photography at the Princeton University Art Museum, and one of the stewards of the Minor White Archive at Princeton, who first suggested that we host a symposium and who has co-organized the event with me. We are appreciative of the support received from the Minor White Archive and the Princeton University Art Museum, which allows for this event to be free and open to the public. In addition to those present today in the Witzel Auditorium, at the museum, we are live streaming this event on our YouTube channel. We welcome all those who are watching from afar and we invite you to participate by asking questions. They can be submitted through YouTube if you have a Google account. After each talk, we do expect to have time to take questions or comments from the audience so that everyone in the auditorium as well as those watching online can hear your question. Please wait for us to give you a microphone. While we hope that you are able to join us for the entire event, we realize that it is quite a full day, so do feel free to come and go as necessary. We also hope that you will be able to spend some time in the current exhibition, In the Beginning, Minor White's Oregon Photographs, which is located on level 2M of our Jubit Center for Modern and Contemporary Art. When leaving the auditorium, you can simply turn left and take the elevator or the stairs to level 2M. For those of you who are not in Portland, you can visit our website, portlandartmuseum.org, click on the Exhibitions tab at the top of the page, and under Current Exhibitions, a link to In the Beginning will allow you to see all of the prints included in the current exhibition. A reminder that In the Beginning will refresh in early May. The current selection of prints is on view through Sunday, May 6th, and a second set of White's Oregon photographs will open to the public on Saturday, May 12th. The reason for this two-part exhibition is quite simple. I couldn't bring myself to eliminate more than a few of White's WPA photographs from my checklist. They are all exceptional, and the only ones I could cut were those that are in need of some conservation, which amounted to approximately five prints or so. In addition, I didn't want to shove too many photographs into a space that couldn't properly hold them all at one time. So here we are with a second minor white exhibition scheduled. So I'm going to switch over to my, it worked. I'm gonna start off today's events with a talk about the importance of Minor White's early work at the Portland Art Museum, as well as his continuing connections to the museum years after leaving Oregon. I will extend beyond his WPA photographs, so this title may be a bit misleading. For those of you who have heard me speak before, I normally don't read my papers, but in the interest of staying within time boundaries and in an effort to be as accurate as possible, I'll be reading this time. There is uh, quite a concentration of minor white experts here today, even individuals that perhaps knew him personally, uh, and I don't want to wander away from the facts or from minor's history. I do welcome any corrections from those who know more about this time period in white's career than I do. Because my position is titled the minor white curator of photography, I am frequently asked what minor white has to do with Portland. While he is a renowned figure in the history of modernist American photography, his photographic beginnings in Oregon are often minimized or overlooked and are, in many respects, almost completely unknown, especially when compared to the attention he continues to receive for his later work in Rochester and at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or for Aperture, and even to an extent for his later 1940s and early 1950s work in California. The current exhibition and this symposium aim to change that. Although most of us have come to know Minor White through the symbolic, metaphoric photographs he created during his mid and later career phases, his early photographic practice was rooted in the complex realities of the 1930s and the 1940s, 
such as the growing pains of a riverside city rushing to modernize, a country struggling to emerge from economic devastation, and international forces that would soon pull the country and White himself into war. In these early works, we can find glimmers of White's later photographic practice, but we would be unwise to look past the value of White's first photographic phase and its continuing resonance in our effort to grasp the energy and intention of the later work. It is equally important to recognize his sustained fondness for this region and its photographers, as well as his continuing influence on today's artists working nearby. The two-phase exhibition in the beginning, Minor White's Oregon Photographs, which, as I just mentioned, will reset with a new group of prints in about three weeks' time and continue through October of this year, honors the Portland Art Museum's 125th anniversary and its photography collection, which was more formally established in 1942 with the permanent loan of White's photographs. This permanent loan is a rather unusual arrangement that I will explain more thoroughly in a few moments. Minor White arrived in Portland from Minnesota in the late spring of 1937, around his 29th birthday, with a newly acquired Argus C3 35 millimeter camera and very little cash. He moved into the YMCA, worked as a night clerk at the Beverly Hotel, and joined the Oregon Camera Club mostly to have access to their technical knowledge, library resources, and their darkroom, as his aesthetics never quite matched their more conservative pictorial visual leanings. By 1938, he had installed a darkroom and began an education and exhibition program at the YMCA, and after brief stints photographing for a housing improvement rights group at Reed College, the People's Power League as well, and even Bonneville's Rod and Gun Club newsletter, he was hired to be a creative photographer for the Oregon Art Project, a subsidiary of the Federal Works Progress Administration, which was one of the major governmental programs that provided funds and often meaningful work for some of the many millions of individuals severely affected by the Great Depression. Indeed, various arms of the Works Progress Administration, or WPA, employed 8.5 million people during its eight years of existence. Under its auspices, communities throughout the nation received funds to build public buildings, as well as roads and other types of critical infrastructure. But the administration did not leave artists or their valuable skills behind. It also established Federal Project No. 1, which was championed by Eleanor Roosevelt and oversaw the Federal Art Project, the Federal Music Project, the Federal Theater Project, the Federal Writers Project, and the Historical Records Survey. All of these arms of the WPA created financial relief and allowed various branches of the arts to survive and sometimes even thrive during the worst economic downturn in the country's history. I will leave it to my colleagues to discuss the nature and meaning of White's early photographs, but the, his work for the WPA, primarily produced in 1938 and 1939 and a bit into the 1940s as well, and largely focused on the city's waterfront buildings being readied for clearing for parking lots and a new street system, and his striking images of the city's critical waterfront industry became a cornerstone of this museum's photography collection, which now numbers close to 10,000 works. In 1942, as war programs ramped up and Depression-era programs such as the WPA wound down, the federal government, faced with an overabundance of artwork produced through its programs, placed prints, posters, sculptures, paintings, and photographs with institutions nationwide that held connections to the works makers and regions. After they had been exhibited in various government-supported art centers, 76 of White's photographs, arriving in two groups in mid-1942, were placed on permanent loan here at the Portland Art Museum. Two of the first batch are on the screen right here. And uh, this is a partial list of that group from our registers files, and uh, this document dates to June 25th of 1942. A number of the images listed here are on, currently on view upstairs. Two of the images from the second group, which I showed earlier, are demonstrated here. 
and an additional permanent loan of 10 of White's images of Eastern Oregon arrived later that year. In 1943, a final group of photographs was placed with the museum, bringing the total WPA-supported works by White to 107. These pictures form the original core of the museum's current photography holdings. Although photographs were regularly exhibited at the museum from 1905 onward, often in annual exhibitions of work by members of the Oregon Camera Club, the same camera club that was helpful to, but not philosophically aligned with White, and the museum's library possessed photographs including Edward Curtis's 20 volume set, The North American Indian, the medium was first treated as at least somewhat equal to painting, sculpture, and prints with the permanent loan of White's Oregon photographs in 1942, about 45 years after the institution began accessioning other forms of art. And lest you think that the government has perhaps lost track of its belongings, the General Services Administration checks in quite regularly with us about our entire collection of WPA-related artworks. This loan agreement demonstrates the typical three-year renewal cycle. This is only a part of the loan agreement, the full loan agreement. Uh, and to answer a question that may arise and often does arise, uh, no, I do not believe that the government will take these away from us anytime soon. At least I hope they don't. White's prints produced for the WPA that toured art centers for about two to three years before returning to Oregon and arriving at the museum were not the only manifestations of his efforts in Oregon. His archival holdings, which we will discuss further in today's third session, offer evidence of many underemphasized or forgotten aspects of White's time in Oregon, as well as the threads that continue to tie him to the region into the 1960s. WPA negatives that arrived at the museum from parts unknown sometime in the 1950s, and unfortunately the details of their arrival uh, remain murky to this day, demonstrate later work that White did for the WPA in Portland and in Eastern Oregon. In early 1940, he photographed a number of artists making work through the WPA's fine arts program, including the painting of a mural in the library of Abernathy School, a Portland public school located in Lad's Edition, which is still part of the school system and is located just two or so miles from here. Indeed, these negatives have been used to research the history of the mural, which has been painted over at least five times since the 1950s. The original library is now a classroom, and to promote efforts to fund the full restoration of the mural which it seems has been more than successful. Uh, and if you Google Abernathy School mural and the artist's name, information does quite readily come up. And you'll notice at the bottom um, information that uh, the school received a 2017 Heritage Commission grant, so just a few months ago, uh, that will allow for the cleaning and restoration of the original the original mural. Uh, what I do find interesting is when I uh, look online and, and find Miner's photographs of this mural uh, that directly relate to his work, you see the one in the top left over here, uh, none of them are credited. So that's something that uh, would be great to potentially correct. In mid-1940, still working for the WPA, White relocated to far northeastern Oregon to teach for and eventually manage the Grand Ronde Valley Art Center in La Grande. While teaching his own photography classes three nights a week and running the facility, he also documented the many activities of the government-supported art center, including children's art classes, theater, teas, and even fundraising art auctions. In late 1941, as the nation's economic crisis eased and the war machine engaged, White left his WP, WPA position, returning to Portland with the general aim of establishing a commercial photography practice. The Portland Art Museum, already aware of his work, exhibited his photographs of Eastern Oregon in February of 1942, the same year it commissioned him to photograph two nearby historic houses with the trustee's blessing and the, quote, understanding that the work done by the Historical Building Survey or the WPA should not be duplicated, unquote. White managed to make the photographs of the Dolphin Lindley houses, and I will discuss these negatives and prints later this morning. 
But he was drafted by the US Army soon thereafter and was unable to print for the museum's exhibition of the work that took place later that year. Although busy with training, in June, White wrote from an undisclosed Hawaiian island, we now know it was Oahu, to museum director Robert Tyler Davis, expressing his concern about the state of the negatives, asking, are you satisfied with the pics of the two houses? They were made so rapidly that I find I only have a hazy idea of them left. Hope Grant is not having too much trouble with them. Also hope a good set of prints is arrived at. Davis replied that Grant, an employee at the museum and one of the few not called to war, had, quote, quite a job remaking a few of the prints and mounting them all, unquote. But that the show of the photographs was to open that very day, July 3rd. In that same letter, Davis explains to White that the Oregon Art Project offices recently closed and that many of White's photographs stored there had been placed at the museum. A selection of White's Dolph and Lindley House photographs, the homes were torn down in 1942 and 1951 respectively, went on view at the museum again in the summer of 1950. Like many of the waterfront buildings White photographed for the WPA, the houses were by then seen as unpleasant relics of a bygone era. The introductory text for the 1950 exhibition, written by an unknown author, stated, quote, Few people think of the second half of the 19th century in America as one of these, this country's great eras. It is usually considered a somber and generally mediocre era, unquote. The text later continued that wealthy Americans' homes of the period were not marked by good taste or selectivity and, quote, since the people of means had more money than could be spent sensibly, they spent it carelessly. But in spite of the general tendency to ridicule the houses of this period, these photographs reveal a craftsmanship and attention to detail not often found today, unquote. There was no mention of White in this document. White's house photographs of 1942 were not his final connection to director Robert Tyler Davis or the Portland Art Museum. After the war, while studying at Columbia University and spending time with Beaumont and Nancy Newhall at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, White endeavored to return to Portland, hoping that the Portland Art Museum would establish a photography instruction and exhibition program at its school. The original letters between White and Davis, which are on view in the exhibition upstairs, suggest White's enthusiasm and Davis's reticence to follow through with such an endeavor at that time. In January 1946, White wrote a detailed outline of the potential program, which was based on MoMA's own newly founded photography center. In late March, director Davis replied to White, writing, quote, the situation here is still very vague. The school is terribly crowded as we have a daytime registration of 20 students, mostly full-time, and an evening registration of over 225. There is talk right now of raising money to build a new wing, but this will not come off for several years. I hope you will go through with your plan to come back here eventually, but I should say that a couple years of the kind of work you are doing would not be all to the good, would be all to the good. And the project here would probably be that much stronger for being postponed a year or two, unquote. Just a few months later, Ansel Adams hired White to teach at the California School of Fine Arts. He remained there until late 1953, when he relocated to Rochester to work with Beaumont Newhall at George Eastman House, later joining the faculty at the Rochester Institute of Technology. You can imagine my feelings on this. <laughs> Happy for California and New York and Massachusetts, but sad for us. And yet, the pull of Portland often em emanating from the Portland Art Museum, kept tugging at White. He returned briefly in early 1951, along with Ansel Adams and J. Walter Thompson's art director, Renee Weaver, to jury a photography exhibition for the museum. Corresponding documents are on view now in the exhibition upstairs. According to an Oregon Journal newspaper article documenting the jurying, over-enlargement of prints was frowned upon by all three jurors, and Ansel Adams felt that, quote, Oregon photographers should do better printing, unquote. 
a highly skilled printer of black and white photographs, as you probably know, Adam's judgment is severe, but not surprising. In 1959, White, now regularly working in a metaphoric vein, was invited back to Portland in conjunction with the state of Oregon's centennial celebrations. Sequence 13, Return to the Bud, a major exhibition of more than 100 of his photographs that had first shown at George Eastman House, was exhibited in the Centennial Exhibition Building, both intriguing and perplexing Oregonian writer Harold Hughes, who wrote that the work was pretty far out. <laughs> White also worked through the museum school that summer, teaching a Centennial workshop from July 20th through the 29th. His course was exceedingly popular, eventually pushing a group of 15 acolytes to establish a long-distance critique group with White, and he was invited to return to Oregon to teach in 1960. Here is a brochure explaining that. And he was invited back again in 1961 and 1962, all the way through 1966. And in these wonderful documents from the Princeton archive, you can see the connections that continue between the Museum Art School and White over time. The workshops were meaningful not only to his avid students, but to White as well, who regularly wrote about his love and delight for the work. In an August 59 letter to Beaumont and Nancy Newhall, he wrote, I cannot define what happened, but one of the participants said, I joined the workshop to learn about photography and am finding out how to live. White continued, quote, the photographs turned out in the last shooting the photographs turned out in the last shooting have a song in them, unquote. In this 1962 postcard to his mother in Minnesota, shown on the left, White writes that his just completed Portland workshop was a very rewarding experience and that he is on his way to the coast for the old timers who were his regular attendees, many of whom would become part of the aforementioned long distance interim critique group. In a July 1960 letter written to the Newhalls during that year's Portland workshop, White explained of his students, quote, the range and scope of the 40 members of the beginning workshop is amazing. One urologist, or penis machinist, one radiologist, his words not mine, one radiologist, one state senator, one lawyer, several school teachers, a travel agent, and a number of people who are running their first roll of film through their first camera at the age of 89. I don't know how they do it, but they seem to get something from us. Some of White's repeat students and members of the interim group for whom the, uh, he critiqued remotely, mostly men, but not all, are now part of the museum's permanent collection and include, but are not limited to, Edwin Dolan, of no relation, and Bill Galen, who still lives here in town and visits the museum regularly. And his photograph is up on the wall uh, with, um, with White in the exhibition in a photograph by an unknown artist. Also, L.K. Andrews and Maxwell Alera. Maxwell Alera's son is here with us today. And also, images by Arnold Rustin and Ray Wing. And I believe that Ray's daughter is here with us today. Hi, Sharon. So many connections. In conclusion, I hope this brief and nowhere near thorough enough overview of Minor White's early professional years in Portland and his continuing, continuing ties to the region, this museum, and area photographers demonstrates the importance of studying his full career, particularly through the objects he left behind, his photographs and archival materials. I will leave you with words from Minor himself about his time in Oregon, from a postcard he wrote to his mother on July 16, 1959, just before beginning his first centennial workshop. It is now in Princeton's archive. Made it to Portland last night about 10, in superb condition, feeling better than ever. Sun and wind and mosquitoes, hot dry days, cool nights, bathing in mountain streams, the Columbia River is stimulating. The things seen and photographed have been magnificent. 
the finest trip I have ever made. And the work here promises to be a continuation of stimulation. Love, Minor. Thank you. As is unusual in events like these, we are absolutely perfectly on time and perhaps even a little bit early. Uh, so we certainly do have time for questions. Julia, the WPA photographs that are in the collection, or that are on the loan from the government are um, prints. Yes. Does the, do the negatives for those continue to exist and are other sets of the prints um, uh, collected? And if so, at what institution? So uh, I believe there are people who have more information on that than I do, and Ken Hawkins is one. Uh, many of the negatives are over at the Oregon Historical Society, and we'll talk about, later, uh, talk about that later. We uh, do not have the negatives from those images for the most part. We have the later images that he made uh, primarily in eastern Oregon. There are images... Uh, vintage prints from these groups that are in different places. I know the um, Princeton University Archive has some in the collection there. There are about 30 of them at the uh, Multnomah County Library right down the street. And so you can actually go to the rare books room and have a look at those as well. Uh, some of those were duplicates uh, when the groupings were sent to us. Some remained behind at the library or were given to the library because some of them were in fact duplicates. And then I believe Oregon Historical Society has some as well. And then some have made their way into various collections. Very rarely we'll see them come up at different places. Um, it's not something I'm uh, fully apprised of in terms of who has how many where. I would hesitate to say that we have the largest collection of them because I'm not positive about that. I would like to think that we do uh, and hope that we do because it's a nice, um, nice thing to be known for, certainly. Uh, and because those groupings were used for such a, a, a number of years and moved around to different art centers and used as exhibitions for people to visit. They were all together, which was great. So then when the government dispersed them, they mostly came together to us. So for us to have a, a larger grouping of them would certainly make sense. But I will be happy uh, as we go on, if anybody has any further information, we can answer that question further. You mentioned his correspondence with the New Halls. Is that part of a larger social group of friends of his? I'm not familiar with who they are. I apologize. I should have uh, filled that in. So Beaumont and Nancy Newhall. Uh, Beaumont was uh, one of the first early curators at the Museum of Modern Art in photography. Uh, and right at the time that uh, Minor was getting to know him. Edward Steichen was returning for more and moving into the chair position of the uh, of the uh, photography department there. So you actually do see some friction in some of the letters going back and forth because uh, Beaumont and and Edward Steichen, uh, also a massive important name in the history of photography, um, they did not get along so well. So Beaumont eventually, and Beaumont knew how was a photographer as well, and you will occasionally see some of his photographs out and about. Uh, he eventually went to the George Eastman House in Rochester, and so Minor, a number of years later, after stopping off in California and working with Ansel Adams for a number of years, through Beaumont goes, goes on along to, um, to Rochester to be with Beaumont and his wife Nancy. And uh, the I had just visited this past last week uh, the Princeton Museum archives, the Minor White archives there, and the wealth of information there is incredible. Um, we have limited information about Minor's time. Fortunately, Minor kept so many of his records and his letters and his postcards to his mother and his friends. So there is an incredible amount of information to be mined there. And most of the information about things like the um, Group 15 and the Interim Group, which was this group that I had mentioned of people in Portland who would send their photographs in a tape recorder to Minor in Rochester. He would look at the photographs and he would record his thoughts and opinions about the works and then send the tape recorder and the tape back to Portland with the photographs and the group would get together um, because they missed him when he wasn't here teaching his workshops um, 
during the rest of the year. Um, all of that information, mine are kept, and I haven't seen that information here in Portland before. So I was able to take a look through all of it, and I'm still kind of going through and, and determining who did what in the interim group or with group 15. So it's an incredible, incredible resource that Princeton now has, and we're so fortunate that they were able to save it and keep it for, uh, for future reference and use.